On behalf of TA Instruments, I want to welcome you to part two in our series, Advances in Biopolymers. I'm your host, Gene Gates. I'm so glad to see so many of you are so excited about the future of biopolymers. Uh, there are, in fact, exciting advancements happening all the time. And today, you'll hear from three highly respected experts in the field. I mean, we all know that bioengineered and biodegradable polymers offer the promise of being more environmentally friendly than others, but there are some unique challenges that come from that wonderful solution. So today, we're gonna to talk about the bleeding edge of advancements with Professor Eric Cochran from Iowa State University, uh, Dr. Raj, uh, Vice President Polymers R&D at CJ Biomaterials, and Dr. Megan Robertson, a professor at Cullen College, William A. Brookings Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Houston. It's gonna be a great day. We're excited to get your questions. We're gonna have all three presenters at the end of the presentations. We're gonna to go to your questions, but if you have questions during the presentations, you can ask the questions in the Q&A box that's provided in the app. And at the end of the third presentation, we're gonna go back and we're gonna go through the Q&A session. So we expect each presentation to run about 20 minutes. So in approximately 60 minutes from now, uh, that's when we're gonna to go to the Q&A. Uh, I hope you enjoy today's presentations. There's gonna be a lot to learn. Our first presenter is uh, Eric Cochran. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. All right, uh, well, without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so I would like to start the, the webinar by sharing uh, a little bit about how we've approached um, in my research group, uh, the development of, of biopolymers. So the, the talk is entitled Bootstrapping Biopolymers, Multifaceted Approaches for Developing Materials that We Can Live With. And so the work is, is all done by my research group. So it's, they're the, the ones that make it exciting to come in to work every day. So I'm gonna be highlighting um, a little bit of Prerna's work. So she just graduated and is at BASF now, as well as a lot of Naku's work, who's long since graduated, but he's uh, started a, a startup company based on his biopolymers research, as well as some assistance from uh, Baker Keel, Michael Forrester, and Austin Homan uh, there in the back. So the work is supported by a variety of different funding agencies and private organizations uh, at the state and federal levels. Uh, so the Center for Bioplastics and Biocomposites has been a, a, a big part of our, our bioplastics research program. Uh, we've had quite a bit of support from the checkoffs, the United Soybean Board and the Iowa Soybean Association um, the USDA, um, the state of Iowa, uh, the National Academies, Department of Energy, and uh, the Iowa Department of Transportation, and of course, the National Science Foundation. Uh, Soyle Innovations is a startup company that we, we work with uh, now with some of these technologies uh, lead the university, um, as well as color biotics. Uh, so I just want to start with uh, this kind of big overview of the whole, uh, the whole picture of, of plastics use. Um, globally. So there's this really nice uh, review article uh, by Geyer, Jambeck, and Law that published in 2017 that does a mass balance over all plastics that have ever been produced and consumed over the 65-year period beginning in, in 1950. So these numbers are in millions of, of metric tons. So we're looking at close to 20, 20 trillion pounds of polymers that have been produced uh, since 1950. Um, a good chunk of those are still in use, and uh, a lot of those have, have been discarded and are currently uh, you know, in landfills, in the ocean, released to the environment, and uh, another big chunk of those have been incinerated, you know, which is not the, the greatest way to end-of-life uh, plastics. So if you dig down into uh, the numbers, you'll see that uh, the cumulative numbers are impressive, but... Uh, Oh, just really just over the last few years that, that a lot of this polymer production and consumption has occurred. So in present day, we're looking at about 1 trillion pounds of polymers used every year globally. And that number is going to be increasing as, as some of the world's uh, economies continue to develop and several billions of people uh, start to demand these materials. And it's not really just one type of material that we're talking about. Those, those trillions of polymers are very highly segmented. So this is just a very coarse grained 
view of one way of, of how to segment that, that polymer industry with polyolefins um, a, comprising a, a big chunk of that along with polyvinyl chloride, uh, the polyesters, the polyamides, uh, and then polyurethanes and acrylics. So just a really wide variety of different uh, types of physical properties, chemical properties, barrier properties, and lifespans for all the variety of applications that these materials are used. So we think about biopolymers and how are biopolymers going to compete with that. And we're just shy of 5 million metric tons of bioplastic production uh, projected for 2022, which is nearly double the about 2.5 million metric tons of bioplastics that were produced in 2021. So there's a lot of room under this tent for uh, developing a, a new future based on biopolymers versus solely petroleum-based polymers. So as, uh, as petroleum becomes scarce or expensive, uh, there's going to be natural incentives to de developing alternatives, uh, but we have, to, we have to do that carefully in a way that we can all live with. So if we, if we start just a simple upper bound, on how many biopolymers we can have. Uh, we can look at how much biomass is, is produced globally. So uh, there's a, another uh, paper that was uh, published a couple of decades ago that estimates that about 100,000 million metric tons of, of biomass on a dry basis is, is produced um, you know, by the planet every year. And that's gonna obviously be split between uh, the land and the sea and a huge chunk of that's gonna be inaccessible are impractical to use for purposes like uh, developing materials. So our, our big overarching question is how do we efficiently convert this, this biomass that, that Earth provides us into useful materials that are going to have natural organic demand versus being propped up uh, by subsidy or mandate? So uh, one way that we, uh, that we work to, to answer uh, those questions is by uh, trying to, to work with the, the largest number of stakeholders as possible. And so the Center for Bioplastics and Biocomposites is one important way in which that happens. So we have uh, a consortium here of uh, nearly 30 different companies uh, poised uh, all along the bioplastic supply chain, beginning with uh, you know, agricultural converters like Archer Daniels Midland, ranging to polymer producers, like BASF, Danimer, or NatureWorks, and ranging all the way to very uh, large integrated end users uh, like John Deere or Ford Motor Company. Uh, together, this collective, uh, with support from the National Science Foundation, uh, deals with research projects ranging from the synthesis of new monomers, new biomonomers, new biopolymers, uh, developing uh, those initial uh, new materials coming up with uh, property and processing uh, strategies for them, developing bio-based products and new applications, integrating those uh, with fillers and fibers, and also modeling and measuring end-of-life um, aspects of those bioplastic materials. Companies join us uh, because they get to leverage a, a pretty modest uh, membership fee uh, It goes into a member fund pool that supports uh, nearly $2 million worth of university research on an annual basis that's leveraged with NSF support, university cost share, faculty time, and access to university and research facilities. Uh, they get to work with uh, over 80 faculty that participate in the center. They also get to work with um, students ranging from the undergraduate, master's, and doctoral level, work with them throughout their projects, uh, offer them internships, and uh, ultimately hire them uh, when they graduate. And they also get a lot of interaction with uh, their industry peers, uh, both in similar organizations and organizations either up or down from them in the supply chain, but which leads to a lot of professional uh, development um, opportunities for the, for the industry persons that participate in the center. So as I continue in the talk, um, I want to just want to give a, a few different examples of, of how we've approached the, the biopolymer bootstrapping uh, problem in our research group. And to, to motivate that, I just want to introduce a simple dichotomy 
of uh, biopolymers versus drop-in replacements versus uh, the development of cost or performance advantage materials. So drop-in replacements are, are a pretty obvious way of replacing uh, petroleum-based materials with, uh, with bio-based materials. Uh, the advantage there is they're fully interchangeable uh, with the incumbent. So if we think of uh, the market segmentation of the polymers that we use, having a drop-in and replacement is, is really nice because you don't have to guess or develop new markets for how uh, that material is gonna be incorporated um, or accepted uh, by the industry. The downside of, of drop-in replacement strategy is it's very hard to compete on a cost basis with the petroleum derived chemicals. So there's several companies that have been trying uh, for over a decade now to come up with a competitive bio-based uh, acrylic acid, which is uh, obviously a huge component of the uh, just the acrylic segment of the polymers industry. And there are also some success stories uh, like Braskem's uh, bio-based polyethylene, where uh, you know, they're able to get market acceptance uh, however, the, the volume of polyethylene that's needed to satisfy polyethylene demand is, is nowhere near met uh, to date by uh, the bio-based alternative for that. So if we think about bootstrapping biopolymers, um, can we leverage the unique properties that uh, biomass and biomass-derived chemicals have um, to offer similar function to incumbent materials um, but offer either cost or performance advantages that um, have a, a natural uh, a demand side pull for the, the market to accept these new materials. So obviously the big challenge there is since we're talking about new materials, there's going to need to be new manufacturing, new processing, and new usage patterns uh, that have to be developed. And all, that all takes money and time. Uh, nonetheless, there are also success stories uh, with this strategy for introducing a new bio-based materials. Uh, so one interesting one is there's a starch-based uh, paint stripper uh, that uh, is advantaged over incumbent materials because it uh, very effectively strips paint without damaging a fragile material underneath the paint. So the military, for example, has, has adopted these starch-based paint strippers for maintenance of uh, military aircraft. And then um, we have, of course, your, your more recognizable consumer products like biodegradable straws. So these are polyhydroxy and alkanoate uh, based straws and the nearly ubiquitous uh, 3D printer filament that, uh, that we get from polylactide um, these days. So as a, as a first example from, from our research group, uh, we can think about the meconic acid platform. And so this is from some Department of Energy uh, sponsored research where we're specifically thinking about cis meconic acid, which uh, can be produced fermentatively um, on, on a commercial scale. Um, I've heard of titers as, as high as 80 grams per liter, which as far as a biosynthetic compound goes is, is pretty good, uh, but it's still not quite at the process intensity yet such that it necessarily is gonna make economic sense to convert that meconic acid and to drop in replacements like terephthalic acid, which is of course the main precursor for polyethylene terephthalate, or nylon 6,6 precursors like adipic acid or hexamethylene diamine. On the other hand, uh, you can also uh, form novel species from cystis meconic acid. You can partially hydrogenate using electrochemistry to trans 3 hexene dioic acid, which is analogous to adipic acid except that it has this unsaturation site in the middle that can potentially be leveraged, as well as uh, an isomerized meconic acid that's uh, more uh, readily accessible or addressable by standard chemistry uh, processing techniques. So uh, in this example, we're gonna focus on um, upgrading trans-trans meconic acid into uh, unique co-monomers that can potentially get market traction by adding value to the existing polyamides that, that we use today. And so that really emphasizes this concept that bioadvantaged materials have to have something unique that they offer to overcome the cost and expense associated with their nation development. So specifically, we can look at some of the 
the issues that we face with uh, incumbent polyamides. So nylon 6.6 or polyamide 6.6 is uh, it's a very useful uh, thermo engineering thermoplastic. You make high performance fibers from it. You make fishnets from it. Uh, it's also uh, injection molded into high durability parts. Um, its Achilles heel, however, is uh, at the C6 carbon level. And there's quite a bit of hydrogen bonding that can be disrupted by the ingress of water. So nylon 6.6 is very moisture sensitive, especially in the amorphous phase where uh, the packing of the nylon chains is significantly lower than it is in the crystal phase. So our concept here was to uh, develop co-monomers that would naturally partition to the amorphous phase um, that have uh, hydrophobic tails uh, like one octene or one tetradecene uh, that will potentially reduce the, uh, the compatibility of these designer PA66s uh, with water. And so this uh, work was uh, done by Prerna uh, and was recently published in JAX. And so the, the idea again is to upgrade sugars using biosynthetic technologies into uh, muconic acid and then using Deal's alder chemistry, very efficiently click in uh, different uh, pendant groups that add novel properties such as uh, hydrophobicity or flame retardants was the, the other example illustrated in the paper. So just to go over a few of the results, uh, there were three different uh, novel monomers that were, uh, that were discussed in the paper for the, the hydrophobic application. So there was just a cyclohexene dioic acid, uh, which is just the, the adduct, the Diels alder adduct with ethylene, and then uh, the adduct with uh, the octene and the tetradecene. So two different uh, aliphatic uh, tails um, added on to that uh, muconic acid. So that NMR clearly shows the, uh, the addition of the, the methyl groups uh, from those pendant groups. As, as well as the alkenes that are added um, at the end of the, the Diels alder chemistry. So working those up into the polymers, we end up with uh, four uh, different nylons, um, a control, um, a zero carbon length, uh, Diels alder adduct, as well as the eight and 12 carbon, um, all in the 20 to 25% uh, mole substitution uh, with respect to adipic acid. Uh, the molecular weights of, of these, these polymers um, on a mass average are all ranging between 40 and 80 kilodalton on the number average uh, between about 13 and 34. And we did have some dispersity issues that we discovered was due to the, the wildly different melting temperatures of the nylon salts uh, that are the precursors uh, to the nylon. So you can improve the dispersity uh, by uh, improving the, the homogeneity of the, the reaction mixture. Uh, but cutting to uh, the, the takeaway is that at this 20 to 25% mole substitution uh, uh, with respect to adipic acid, uh, we do show uh, pretty drastic reductions in uh, moisture uptake, both by direct exposure to uh, uh, bulk water, as well as conditioning um, in a 50% relative a humidity environment. So we see that the, the water resistivity increases with the pendant uh, group chain length. And we also saw that um, mechanical properties uh, weren't really affected like glass transition temperature and modulus. So a second example, uh, going back to uh, the whole idea of uh, drop-in replacements versus a bio-advantage materials. Um, I want to talk about a different family of materials where altogether new manufacturing and processing techniques are required. Um, so if we look at uh, our, our incumbent materials again, all these areas that have been highlighted um, have been made highly efficient and intense processes, um, taking advantage of techniques like coordination polymerization, uh, melt polycondensation, or, or solventless suspension and emulsion uh, polymerization techniques. So really the vast majority of the polymers that we use don't use any sort of organic solvent 
um, in their manufacture, which is uh, really important to, to keeping the manufacturing cost and emissions down. So if we uh, think to uh, bio-based feedstocks that can offer uh, similar types of advantages that have um, the volume that, that can feed into uh, uh, the target market, uh, soybeans is, is one great uh, example. Uh, in the U.S., we grow about 86 million acres of soybeans, leading to about 12 million uh, metric tons of soybean oil. Uh, about 12 years ago, we discovered that we can use reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer polymerization to uh, take functionalized soybean oil, or it's been functionalized with an acrylic moiety, and grow that into uh, thermoplastic homopolymers or thermoplastic uh, block copolymers. Over the years, we've uh, developed a one pot, zero waste, zero volatile organic compound manufacturing process uh, to make these materials at a commercial scale that, like the incumbent industry, makes a, a use of a very uh, efficient process technology. So uh, these are all one pot conversion processes. So uh, the soybean processor uh, starts with soybeans crushes to oil and then epoxidizes two different grades of epoxidized soybean oil. Uh, we can then use a, a chemical converter to uh, add acrylic functionality to that epoxidized hyaluronic soybean oil, uh, further add some partially epoxidized soybean oil as a functional solvent that is incorporated as part of the end use product. And then another couple of hours of, of, of cooking to form a polymer dissolved in a functional solvent. That functional, or that polymer in the functional solvent then is the, the end use product, uh, which can be uh, used uh, directly in a variety of applications. Uh, and we've specifically developed applications uh, for this material um, as polymer modifiers for the asphalt industry. Uh, so just uh, really briefly, uh, the reactor product can be mixed with uh, low quality sources of asphalt, like Viking Tower bottoms or recycled asphalt pavement uh, to produce interstate grade uh, high quality pavements at a lower cost than uh, it would require to use a virgin asphalt binder and incumbent elastomers uh, like SBS. We've also been able to develop novel surfactants uh, based on this technology that allow you to make uh, very fine particle size uh, emulsions that are useful as, uh, as, pavement, as pavement maintenance products, uh, uh, known as, as fog seals in this example, where the microscopic droplets of uh, soybean oil-based polymer uh, get wicked very deeply into the surface structure um, of the pavement, which seals it against water uh, without compromising uh, the traction of the pavement uh, while showing uh, pretty large improvements in uh, the reduction of, of the permeability of water um, into, those, uh, into those structures. You can use uh, similar uh, emulsions to create 100% recycled pavements. Uh, so this is uh, an example from a project that we just did for the uh, Farm Progress Show. Um, here in Iowa just a couple of weeks ago. So here the, the concept is that you take 100% crushed asphalt, you spray uh, this uh, soybean oil-based uh, emulsion um, onto it, and then uh, you just simply compact and you have a new paved surface. Um, and so uh, the, the point here is that uh, biopolymers are not always necessarily going to be used in the same way as the incumbent product. So, so here the soybean oil-based thermoplastic is used uh, in a completely different way than, than SBS, which would be an incumbent material that's used um, in the, the asphalt uh, pavement industry. And I think uh, with uh, the time requirements, um, I'm going to just really go quickly through this, this last example where we're using a similar process technology uh, with uh, crude glycerin, uh, which is available at about 7 million uh, metric tons per year um, from the production of biodiesel. It's a fairly low cost material. And just like with the soybean oil based material, we're able to make uh, a useful product 
with a one pot, zero waste, zero VOC polymer manufacturing strategy. So again, that's just functionalizing with acrylic acid and then using uh, raft polymerization to make a thermoplastic uh, that's then useful as a wood composites adhesive uh, that's competitive uh, with isocyanates, uh, which is uh, the primary incumbent uh, product there. So that's uh, my perspectives on, on how we bootstrap uh, biopolymers. And uh, thanks uh, all for your attendance, and we'll pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Cochran. Again, professor at Iowa State University. You know, his research has produced 110 journal articles and 25 issued patents on topics ranging from thermosets engineered to withstand extreme environments, polymer thermodynamics, bioplastics for the circular economy, and soy-based plastics and rubbers. His presentation today was the value proposition of blending amorphous PHA to PLA. Again, if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A part of the platform, and we're going to get to all of those after our third presenter today. A couple of questions, though. The answers are yes. Are the slides going to be available? Yes. You registered. You attended. We're going to email those slides to you so you can follow up on these presentations. And for those of you uh, that would like to get a certification to show that you've gained this valuable knowledge today, certification will be available as well, and we'll have information forthcoming on that. Again, thank you, Dr. Cochran. Our next presenter is Raj Krishnaswamy. He is Vice President of Polymer R&D at CJ Biomaterials. That's a CJ bio company. He has 20 years of biopolymer and polymer R&D experience at Chevron Phillips Chemical, Metabolics, and Brascom. Raj is co-inventor on 40 patents, 40 different patents. He's also co-author on more than 40 publications. He recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award in Research Technology by the SPE. Now today, He's going to talk to us about the value proposition of blending amorphous PHA. I'm going to make sure I got that right. I think I don't got that right. Let me go down here. Yeah. You have the value. Right, yes. Okay. <laughs> I know we had a little confusion on that. So it's going to be the value proposition of blending amorphous PHA to uh, PLA. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Raj. Thank you, Gene. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, screen is not showing up on my end. It's still stuck on one of uh, Eric's old slides. Okay, we have your video camera on now, so hopefully okay. there we go. Okay, there it is. Perfect. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank Mike from TA Instruments for extending this invitation and also to Gene for hosting this event. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion and to the Q&A. Uh, but before I get started, uh, you know, CJ Bio or the CJ company is not very well known in the plastics value chain. So I thought I should spend a little bit of time talking about who CJ is. Uh, CJ is a large corporation. It's a Korean-based corporation. They are in multiple businesses with annual revenues over $30 billion. One of the divisions of CJ is Bio, CJ Bio division, and that's the division that we belong to. And one of the attributes of CJ Bio, which is very pertinent to biopolymers or biomaterials, is the fermentation expertise of CJ Bio. CJ Bio has over 700 kilotons of fermentation capacity that's installed worldwide. With this expertise and fermentation, both from an engineering point of view and from a technology point of view, this brings a lot of value to the fermentation of PHAs. And I think that makes CJ a very interesting and very capable company to bring this new family of polymers into the marketplace. So how did CJ Bio get started in the biopolymer or biomaterial space? It started through the acquisition of technology from Metabolics. So some of you might be familiar with a company called Metabolics that started in the late 90s and actually built a plant with Archer Daniels Middle and built and operated a PHA plant in the early 2000s. The company went out of business in 2016 when CJ Bio acquired all of the technology and all of the uh, polymer related assets from Metabolics. That's really how CJ got into the uh, polymer space. 
Since 2016, CJ Bio has worked on the manufacturing process and actually improved the manufacturing operations. And very recently in 2021, they started construction of the first plant. So the first PHA plant was commissioned in 2022, earlier this year, and we'll talk a little bit more about that asset. So before I go in and talk about PHA specifically, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about classification of polymers, both from a carbon source point of view and also from an end of life point of view. So on this slide, you're looking at two dimensions. On the x-axis, you go from, on the x-axis, you're looking at the carbon source all the way from fossil-based carbon to bio-based carbon on the right. And on the y-axis, you're looking at three rows that denote different end-of-life options. So the first row or the bottom row corresponds to non-degradable polymers. The middle row corresponds to polymers that are compostable under very specific conditions, more specifically industrial composting conditions. The top row corresponds to polymers that are naturally biodegradable. And when you look at the carbon source, this is a continuum. It's not an on or, on or off, it's a continuum, right? You can have 100% fossil carbon, you can have 100% biocarbon, and you can also have varying levels of bio-based carbon, like the presentation that Eric made where one of the monomers used in the polymerization can be bio-based. So there is a spectrum, or there's a continuum of bio-based carbon on the x-axis. So when you think about non-degradable polymers, you think about polymers such as polyethylene and polypropylene that are, for the most part, bio-based sorry, for the most part based on fossil carbon. But you also have bio-based polyethylene from brass chem. That's again, non-degradable, but it's a bio-based. So the carbon source is different, but the end of life is still the same. In the middle row, you're looking at polymers like PLA that are both bio-based and industrially compostable. But then you also have polymers such as PBAT and PBS that are industrially compostable, but they're based on fossil carbon. There are versions of PBS today that are based on bio-based carbon, uh, based again, going back to bio-based butane diol and bio-based succinic acid. But the large volume of PBS that's available today is still fossil-based. On the top row, you have polymers that are naturally biodegradable. So before I go there, right? When you think about industrial composting, Generally, you require temperatures of about 50 degrees C or higher and relatively high humidity for these objects to biodegrade. In other words, you need to hydrolyze these polymers into low to medium molecular weight uh, fragments before they can actually biodegrade. So you need very specific conditions for these polymers to biodegrade. But when you look at the top row, you're looking at polymers that can biodegrade in any environment where there's microbial activity. So you don't need special conditions for biodegradation. And the PHA, so the polyhydroxy alkanoids are one such family of polymers that are both bio-based and they're also naturally biodegradable. And I'll spend uh, the rest of the discussion talking specifically about PHAs and also about how PHAs can augment the performance of polylactic acid, which is an industrially compostable polymer. So when you think about the value proposition of PHA, uh, the PHA that we produce at CJ Bio is 100% bio-based. So today we're using sugar as our primary feedstock. So the polymer is 100% bio-based. So from a carbon footprint point of view, this is one of the primary value propositions. Now, when you talk about PHAs, PHAs are naturally occurring polymers. So what does that mean? Any single cell microorganism, if you look at the inside of a single cell organism, such as the bacteria in, in your carpet, about four to 5% of the dry mass of this microorganism is actually a polymer. This is actually a polyester that microorganisms produce and store within, uh, within itself. So these microorganisms use this polymer as a reserve food source. 
So when the microorganism is in an environment where it's deprived of one of its primary nutrients, it essentially breaks down the polymer that's inside its cell and consumes it as food or consumes it as carbon source. So this polymer, this basic polymer that microorganisms produce and accumulate is, is a PHA, or more specifically, it's a homopolymer or 3-hydroxybutanoic acid. So these polymers have existed ever since single cell life existed on Earth. So they are, they've existed forever. So what makes CJ Bio's technology unique? So CJ, through microbial engineering technologies, we're able to increase the accumulation of polymer within the microorganisms from 4 to 5%, which is the default, to up to 85 90%. So we're essentially converting these genetically modified microorganisms into polymer producing factories. So once the polymer is produced, it can then be recovered using very standard chemical unit operations. And then these products can be converted. It's a thermoplastic, and we'll talk a little bit more about the properties of the polymer in just a little bit. It is a thermoplastic, so it can then be converted into products that other polymers are used in with the exception that the end of life is significantly different for these polymers because these polymers are fundamentally food for bacteria. Again, remember that these microorganisms produce and store this polymer as a reserve food source. And so because the polymer is food for bacteria, they're naturally biodegradable. Or in other words, they will biodegrade in any environment where there's microbial activity. More specifically, they will biodegrade in soil at ambient conditions. They will biodegrade in oceans. They will biodegrade in freshwater lakes, industrial and home composting environments. So when you think about the value proposition of PHA in general, first, it's bio-based. So from a carbon footprint point of view, from a greenhouse gas point of view, this is highly advantaged. And secondly, from an end of life point of view, PHAs are biodegradable in a variety of environments. So you don't need to create specific composting infrastructure for these products to biodegrade. So the next point I want to make is one of the unique abilities of CJ Bio's technology is the ability to produce a variety of polymer compositions within this PHA space. So today, CJ Bio, as a company, we're focused on copolymers of 3HP and 4HP. So when you look at the bottom, you see two different charts here. So the first chart on the left is crystallinity as a function of co-monomer content. And on the right, you're looking at glass transition temperature shown as a function of 4-HB content. So 4-HB is the co-monomer co here. So the 3-HB homopolymer at 0% 4-HB or 0% co-monomer is a highly crystalline polymer, 60, 65% crystallinity, with a glass transition temperature that's very close to zero degrees centigrade. Or in other words, the homopolymer has properties that are very similar to isotactic polypropylene. As you increase the amount of co-monomer in the polymer, as you incorporate more 4-HP into the backbone, you see a systematic decrease in both crystallinity and the glass transition temperature, as you would expect, because 4-HB is considered a defect from a 3-HB crystallization point of view. So the 4-HB is dis disrupting the crystallizability of 3-HB. So I mentioned that our first plant is up and running. The current focus of the first plant is an amorphous PHA. So the first plant has a capacity of five kilotons or about 10 million pounds. And the product that's produced in this first plant is an amorphous version of this PHA. So this amorphous PHA has a glass transition temperature that's close to minus 20 degrees centigrade. And it's fully amorphous. And so because it's amorphous, with a glass transition temperature that's well below room temperature, it's not very useful on its own in many applications. There are applications where it is useful on its own, but I will not be discussing those applications today. But because again, it's rubbery, 
at room temperature. We're going to talk about the value proposition of blending this amorphous PHA with other polymers. And more specifically, we'll talk about blends with PLA. So when you blend amorphous PHA or FACT A1000P into PLA, these are the following benefits that you get in the PLA product. The first thing you observe is that the composting rate of PLA is accelerated significantly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. The amorphous PHA also improves the flexibility and toughness of PLA. With as little as 10% amorphous PHA blended into PLA, PLA goes from being a brittle material at room temperature to being ductile. So in other words, under standard notched isoid impact test conditions, you get non-breaks at 10 to 15% incorporation of amorphous PHA. When you're looking at flexible applications, such as films, the tear propagation and puncture toughness of PLA is significantly enhanced through the incorporation of amorphous PHA. We are achieving all of these without compromising the bio-based carbon content of PLA, because we're now blending two polymers that are 100% bio-based. The composition of this PHA, amorphous PHA, was designed such that its refractive index matches that of PLA. And because the refractive indices are matched, you do not compromise the clarity of PLA. And I do want to point out that these are two-phase systems. They're not miscible. Amorphous pH is not miscible with PLA, and we'll share data on that as well. So even though it's, this is a two-phase system, the polymers are still transparent because of the refract, matched refractive indices. CJ Bio, we've also entered into a strategic partnership with NatureWorks to bring new products and to bring new opportunities to the market that are based on blends of PLA with amorphous PHA. This is simply a picture showing Rich Altais and SJ Lee, the CEOs of NatureWorks and the CJ Biomaterials Group. This was a picture taken during the signing of the MOU. So now when you think about, we'll talk specifically, share some data with you on property enhancement of PLA. So the first chart here, you're looking at the modulus of PLA as a function of how much amorphous PHA is incorporated into the PLA. You see a systematic decrease in modulus, as you would expect. At about 30% incorporation of amorphous PHA, you decrease the PLA modulus by about 50%. Or in other words, you now add the uh, modulus of isotactic polypropylene. One of the polymers that is used to blend with PLA to improve the flexibility of PLA is PBAT, because PBAT is also compostable. But relative to PBAT, you achieve a much greater decrease in modulus or a much greater improvement in flexibility by using amorphous PHA. So this is an advantage that amorphous PHA brings to the table relative to the modification of PLA using PBAT. This arrow mark shows the magnitude of the difference in flexibility. The other advantage is using amorphous PHA is you're improving the flexibility of PLA without compromising bar-based content and without comp compromising clarity, because those are attributes that P PBAT cannot maintain in PLA. Next, when you look at impact modification, Right? Again, you see a significant increase in impact modification. This is notched isod impacts at, at room temperature. And as you bring the amorphous PHA content to about 10 to 15%, you start experiencing non-breaks in the test. So significant improvement in impact toughness. We've also verified that this magnitude of impact toughness or impact improvement is maintained at temperatures of zero degrees centigrade and also at minus 10 degrees centigrade. So this is perhaps, uh, this can open up windows of opportunities for PLA in certain refrigeration applications. As I said before, PLA and amorphous PHA, they are not miscible. So you're looking here at DSC data that shows two distinct TGs for a blend of PLA and amorphous PHA. 
So again, because they're, they're, they are a two-phase system and this micrograph shows the dispersed PHA within the PLA matrix. Again, refractive indices are matched, so you don't see any change in the clarity of PLA. I'm gonna to try to move through some of this pretty quickly now. So when you look at flexible applications, you're looking at tensile elongation and resistance to tear propagation of pure PLA versus PLA modified with 30% amorphous PHA. You see more than a hundred fold improvement in tensile elongation and more than a 30 fold improvement in tear propagation resistance. So significant improvement in the performance of felts. Again, relative to PBAT, we see much better enhancements in both elongation and tear propagation resistance. So again, the amorphous PHA is a much better additive in terms of improving the flexibility and the toughness and the tear propagation resistance of PLA in film applications. And here's another set of data that should excite those that are using PLA products today. Remember, PLA is compostable under industrial compost conditions. So in this particular chart, you're looking at biodegradation as a function of time. And the biodegradation, the y-axis here, is the percent of carbon in the polymer or in the blend that's converted into carbon dioxide during the biodegradation test. And this biodegradation test was conducted at 30 degrees centigrade. Or in other words, this biodegradation was carried out under so-called home composting conditions. You'll see that when you exceed, and again, remember, PLA is not biodegradable under home composting conditions. But at about 35 or 30% incorporation of amorphous PHA, you start seeing biodegradation of PLA under home composting conditions. Or in other words, the carbon conversion here is approaching 80%. And here the carbon conversion is exceeding the carbon that's present in the PHA. So there is significant potential to rendering PLA as a home compostable material by blending amorphous PHA into it. This is preliminary internal data, so we don't yet have confirmation of this, but as we speak, these tests are being confirmed at a third-party lab, OWS, at the moment. So within the next four to six weeks, we should have confirmation or, uh, you know, we may see something contrary to what we are observing in this. But nevertheless, the tests are being carried out at a third-party lab to confirm this, this trend. So in terms of our approach to the market today, we are obviously, I've spent a fair bit of time talking about PLA and the uh, modification of PLA here. So we are taking products to the market that are based on PLA and amorphous PHA. Specifically, we have different master batches that are based on PLA and amorphous PHA. Uh, these master batches contain 45 weight percent amorphous PHA and 55 percent PLA. These master batches are ideal for converters that already have PLA products because they can now dial in the amount of amorphous PHA they want at the line, at the converting line, whether it's it's an extrusion line or a molding line. We also have fully formulated products. So if converters are looking for single pellet solutions, we also have fully formulated products that are based on PLA and amorphous PHA. We're also going to the market. I just want to make sure I mention this. We're also going to the market with blends of PBAT and amorphous PHA, and also PBS and amorphous PHA. The value propositions that we described for PLA, most of them carry over to other compostable polymers like PBAT and PBS as well. So we do have products that are based on those polymers as well. One other thing I want to mention here is that we've observed that the amorphous PHA is also an excellent impact modifier to non-compostable polymers, like cellulose acetate-based polymers, to nylon, levin, and so forth. So we're also looking at amorphous PHA as a performance enhancing additive to other polymers that are not necessarily compostable. So purely a performance play and a bio-based carbon play in those applications. 
So that's where we are today. Right, so today we have about 10 million pounds of amorphous PHA that we're taking to the market. Next year, at about this time next year, we are going to be triple our capacity. So our capacity is going to increase from 10 million pounds annually to about 30 million pounds annually because a second plant will come online next year, this time next year. So the second plant will have the ability to produce both semi-crystalline PHA and also amorphous PHA. So with the second plant, we'll be taking fully PHA products, marine biodegradable product compositions to the market. We will also take PHA-based uh, emulsion coatings for paper and other substrates to the market commercially next year. But we are working on uh, those opportunities today based on our pilot plan. And the last point I want to make is we're currently looking at building a mega scale plant and that activity and conversations have already begun. And this mega scale plant can have a capacity of about 100 million pounds, maybe greater, depending on the business development activities over the next several months. And the location of this mega scale plant is likely to be either in North or South America, where access to uh, raw material and access to market is relatively straightforward. So that's all I have. And I'll be, uh, again, I want to thank Mike and want to thank TA for this opportunity to talk about our polymers, and I'll be happy to take questions at the, at the end. So thanks again. Fantastic job, Raj. Thank you so much. Again, he's Vice President of Polymers R&D at CJ Biomaterials. Uh, that's a CJ Bio company. And as we're learning, if you don't know much about the company, uh, it's newish. So go check it out. There's lots to learn. His presentation today, the value proposition of blending amorphous PHA to PLA, um, and uh, certainly more exciting things to come. Now I'm seeing some really great questions in the chat. So if you have questions, if there's some things you're not completely sure on, please put the question in the chat. We are getting them and we do see them and we will ask them at the end of our next presentation. So once again, thank you Raj Krishnaswamy for this enlightening information. Let's move to our next presenter, Dr. Megan Robertson, a professor at the Colon College of Engineering in the William A. Brookshire Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, located at the University of Houston. She received her PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. The Robertson Research Group works in diverse areas of polymer sustainability, including polymers from renewable feedstocks, degradable polymers, green chemistry, and polymer recycling and upcycling. Dr. Robertson will present degradable thermosets and thermoplastics from renewable resources. Thank you so much for being here today. Dr. Robertson, welcome to you. All right, thank you so much for the nice introduction and uh, also uh, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Uh, so Eric and Raj have given a great introduction on biopolymers and some of the uh, considerations that we need to think about in terms of polymer sustainability. And so I, I won't go into a, a lot of those general details, but we'll kind of just jump in uh, to the discussion of some of our work. Uh, but first, I just want to mention that whether we're thinking about bioresources for polymers or even using more conventional uh, petroleum-based polymers, there are many aspects to the life cycle that we can think about in terms of implementing green chemistry principles. And so this certainly one facet of that can be to utilize a bioresource, but we can also think about things such as uh, the uh, chemical, uh, chemicals that are used in processing, the energy requirements of transportation, uh, processing, synthesis, fabrication, um, and, also, and what happens to the material uh, at the end of their life when they become waste and what options we have for the end of life treatment. And so today, I, I, our, our group, uh, as you can see from the slide, works in a lot of these different areas and various projects. Uh, so I narrowed it down to just uh, one, kind of one and a half topics, uh, uh, where uh, I'll talk about uh, making degradable polymers from uh, bioresources, namely lignin. And uh, first, I'm going to tell you uh, about thermosets, and, and we're thinking about can we incorporate the kind of functionalities, for example, in PHAs that we heard about in the last talk, but now in a thermoset class of polymers, and can that give us additional ways to treat that material at the end of its 
useful lifetime. And then if I have time at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about poly, uh, some work in thermoplastics in our group where we're trying to make more rapidly degradable uh, polymers uh, through incorporating of acetal functionality uh, instead of esters. Okay, so oops, let me get this. There we go. So we've been very interested in using lignin to make polymers. Uh, of course, uh, biomass is, is the most abundant, um, you know, uh, is, is an abundant resource uh, on our entire planet. And uh, lignin is kind of an often neglected component of this, where uh, usually attention is more given to cellulose and health, hemicellulose as feedstocks for materials. Uh, but lignin is about 15 to 30% of lignocellulosic biomass. And it also represents about 30% of the organic carbon in the biosphere. Uh, this is a cross-linked, highly intractable material but uh, there are many people researching ways to break it down into smaller molecules. And our interest lies in taking those lignin depolymerization products and making new materials out of them. It's a highly underutilized resource at the moment. Only about 2% is currently used in specialty products. And otherwise, it's uh, essentially just incinerated as a very low value fuel. So we think this has a lot of promise uh, as a resource for polymers. Here, uh, th this table represents some of the ways that, uh, that lignin can be broken down and then depolymerized into small molecule byproducts. And you can see um, in the bottom of the slide some examples of the uh, lignin depolymerization byproducts. I've highlighted a few of these uh, that I'm going to be talking about as uh, sources for polymers in this talk specifically. But our overarching goal is to take these lignin byproducts, uh, depolymerization byproducts, and make useful materials out of them, both thermosets and thermoplastics. And we want to match the mechanical behavior and thermal behavior that's required for applications. Uh, what, taking this one step further, in this talk and specifically, I'll also be talking about the end of life and how the functionality that we get from uh, these uh, resources, the chemical functionality, can lead to uh, degradable materials. And this can be used for end of life processing. So first I'm gonna tell you about thermosets, specifically epoxy resins. Uh, epoxy resins are typically derived from the diglycidyl ether of bisphenol A, which you can see on the slide. And this is typically cured uh, by reacting with a curing agent, such as an anhydride or an amine. Um, and, uh, and this forms a network polymer, a cross-link polymer, which uh, typically has a very high TG, and so these are thermosets. They have a lot of uh, great applications, um, for example, in structural uh, composites, adhesives. I also show wind turbine blades here, um, and among others. And they're really noted for their high stiffness and strength, chemical heat resistance, and other properties like adhesion. Uh, we were interested in two challenges with uh, the, this class of materials, one being that it's namely derived from petroleum resources. So we wanted to find a bio-based replacement for this uh, DGEBA molecule. Um, and also, with the network structure that is formed, uh, there's really limited end-of-life options. Though these are used in durable goods that could last for a long time, even decades, for example, in the wind turbine blades or in automotive applications, ultimately, they do become waste. And now, with uh, the um, a huge influx of wind energy in our country. Um, we're starting to see the results of this with these blades um, after their finite lifetime uh, filling up landfills. Uh, so we wanted to see if we could address this through making degradable materials. So here are some of the bio-based feedstocks we've been exploring. I'm, I'm talking a lot about lignin today, but we've also used other similar classes of molecules, which are from plants. Um, also, we've used vegetable oil-based uh, feedstocks in the past as well. Um, but in all cases, looking to replace the DGBA uh, as the starting monomer. And why we chose these particular bio-based resources, uh, they're available worldwide, they're non-toxic, they have appropriate chemical functionality to, uh, so that, such that we can functionalize with epoxide groups, which is required for curing the resin. And also they have aromatic structures, which can lead uh, to the, the, give us the right thermomechanical behavior that we're looking for. Um, also, I'll note in all, all of these bio-based uh, monomers, we have uh, esters here and here and over here, um, which can we are going to use uh, as a way to break the materials down at the end of their lifetime through hydrolysis. Uh, so we did make epoxy resins from all of them, all of those starting materials that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, just in short, uh, we could obtain 
epoxy resins with, with very nice uh, thermal behavior, glass transition temperature on par, or even in some cases a little bit higher than the traditional DGBA-based epoxy resin. This is all under a standard curing condition with an anhydride um, using a, a protocol, um, a standard protocol for, for all of these materials where we achieve high conversion of functional groups. And also uh, in terms of mechanical behavior, again, achieving high tensile strength, uh, similar elongation of break, uh, epoxy resins are actually quite brittle, so that, that fact didn't change, high modulus. And so we can, we can obtain the thermal and mechanical properties that are required for applications, but now uh, using these bio-based monomers instead of the traditional petroleum-based monomer. And so now, what about the end of life? Um, in terms of epoxy resins, uh, as I mentioned, we'd have very few options in terms of recycling. Uh, they could be incinerated uh, for energy, but um, if we wanted to pyrolyze them to obtain chemical uh, byproducts, uh, you're talking about very high temperatures. This will be energy intensive and costly. Um, they don't photodegrade very quickly. That's not gonna be practical. And if we wanna use savolysis to break them down, um, oftentimes we have conditions that are not environmentally friendly for these traditional materials, which can be a challenge. Um, but there are now uh, studies in the literature. I'm showing two examples here from two different research groups where the use of bio-based monomers in epoxy resins can lead to enhanced uh, degradation rates. These are hydrolysis and a basic solution, but they use relatively low temperatures, um, whereas before uh, temperatures uh, might have been required uh, for, for the, uh, you know, for example, 180 degrees C here for savolysis of a traditional epoxy resin. Here we're talking about ambient temperatures or maybe uh, some gentle heating uh, can lead to the breakdown of these materials. And so this, this uh, really caught our attention, but uh, the mechanisms of how these materials hydrolyze and break down are still very uh, poorly understood. And I'll note that uh, hydrolysis is one aspect of uh, biodegradation. So even though we are not directly studying biodegradation or composting in this talk, we're really using hydrolysis uh, mechanisms and understanding hydrolysis degradation kinetics as a proxy for for thinking about uh, the, the features of these materials, which would lead to uh, something that could be uh, biodegraded in the future. And that's something we'll study more in our future work, uh, moving beyond just simply looking at hydrolysis. Uh, so there are studies on, on how to understand uh, what factors can influence the hydrolytic degradation rate um, in epoxy resins. You can see people have studied the different monomers will lead to different degradation rates, the monomer to curing agent ratio used, of course, solution conditions, pH, temperature, solvent composition, uh, the addition of catalysts, and that sort of thing. Um, and so we were interested in seeing, uh, you know, knowing all of this about thermoplastics, which have esters, can we impart the same type of ideas to now thermoset materials, which contain esters, which can lead to their degradation behavior? So in our case, we, we took, uh, these are, this is just a simple example using epoxidized soybean oil as, uh, because uh, this leads to a very fast degrading polymer, as you'll see. And in, we take a traditional uh, DGBA-based epoxy resin. We take a soybean oil-based epoxy resin. We soak it in a basic solution um, and then monitor, monitor the mass over time. Um, and also here, visually monitor the sample. And you can see very little happens to the traditional epoxy resin in these highly basic uh, conditions, um, but the soybean oil-based epoxy resin essentially breaks down fully within a matter of a couple of weeks. And this is true for all of our other bio-based uh, uh, epoxy resins as well. They're, the time of degradation is different in each case, but whereas the petroleum-derived epoxy resin really didn't show any change in mass or uh, physical character in that oh, up to uh, we monitor it for, for actually for months, um, up to three months, I believe, and we even uh, doubled the or tripled the base concentration, still no change. All of the bio-based uh, epoxy resins, which have esters, uh, showed this uh, breakdown over time. And of course, we can quantify this. So here's the mass fraction remaining versus time. Again, you're seeing very little change in mass of the uh, epoxy resin from uh, DGBA. Uh, there is, you do see a slight change here. This is because this is actually cured with an anhydride, which uh, produces esters during curing. If we cure it with an amine, however, this will be flat and, and will not change over the course of months. And the bio-based epoxy resins, whether cured with an anhydride or an amine, uh, show much more rapid rates of, of uh, mass loss uh, when in the, in the presence of uh, a water in a basic or, or acidic solution. 
we, uh, we were interested in a little more about the degradation uh, behavior and understanding the mechanism. Here is some information from thermoplastics, which have esters. Uh, PLGA uh, is shown here. The degradation in basic solutions undergoes what's called surface erosion. So you can see this uh, image on the left. Uh, the sample essentially erodes from the outside in. That mechanism is called surface erosion. Or uh, bulk erosion, essentially the solvent diffuses into the sample, and then the sample all just kind of breaks down simultaneously. And so in thermoplastics like PLGA, you see surface erosion in basic solutions, and you see bulk erosion in acidic solutions. And this has to do with how fast the solvent, in this case water, is, go is uh, diffusing into the sample, and also the rate at which the, um, that the chemical groups are, are hydrolyzing, uh, which can be modified by things like the temperature, and in this case, pH. And so in our, we were very surprised to see in our thermoset samples, we see the, actually the same behavior as the thermoplastics, uh, even though the, the type of material is very different. Um, in basic solutions, we also see the characteristic behavior of bulk erosion uh, it, it, for thermosets that is seen in thermoplastics. And we can apply a kinetic model. This is a solid state a kinetic model. It's called the contracting volume model, which essentially means the contraction of the sample from the outside in is the rate limiting step rather than something like a reaction order model. And you can see it fits the data very well and captures this behavior of the uh, surface erosion process that we see in the basic solutions. And we can compare different, the different types of bio-based molecules. Um, and there are many factors which lead to um, the differences in these degradation rates, but they all have a much higher rate constant for hydrolysis as compared to the um, petroleum-based uh, sample uh, DGPA. And in acidic solutions, it's, 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 uh, it's also, uh, we see a very comparable situation to that in thermoplastics, where in thermoplastics you see this, the mass doesn't change initially when it's in the solution, and then at some key time it just sort of drops off, so that's that bulk erosion, first the solvent's going into the sample, and then eventually the sample all starts to degrade. We actually see something which looks a lot like that in our thermosets and our epoxy resins. Um, there, it isn't quite a constant mass, but maybe there's a little bit of surface and bulk erosion going on here, but you see a very slow rate of mass loss and then eventually it just takes off. Um, and so we think this is also dominated by that bulk erosion mechanism in acidic solutions. And again, we can use a kinetic model, this time a reaction order model, um, with autocatalysis captured, this sort of sigmoidal shape that you can see here, um, where you have an initial slower rate of mass loss and then a, a more extreme rate, and then it sort of tapers off. Um, and we found this autocatalysis part is actually quite significant in these materials. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we looked at a lot of different factors which can influence the rate of degradation. We thought about the choice of monomer and how that affects things such as the polymer TG, which uh, you can see our fastest degrading polymer is epoxidized soybean oil, also has the lowest TG. Um, we thought about the, uh, how hydrophilic the material is. We measured the contact angel, angle. Again, the soybean oil-based sample has the uh, lowest contact angle. Uh, we also thought about the ester density. So uh, these polymers all, also have varying cross-link density in the thermoset network and in some cases are very similar to DGBA, the petroleum-based polymer, um, but in other cases are quite a bit lower and that could affect the, the um, for example, the diffusion of water into the material and then related the ester density because soybean oil has three esters per molecule per monomer. Uh, these other uh, bio-based uh, molecules only had one ester per monomer uh, this leads to quite different uh, differences in the uh, ester density as well throughout that thermoset network, um, where the esters are what are hydrolyzing. Um, so all of these are, are factors are competing with one another and lead to the differences that you see in the rate of degradation uh, of these materials. All right, and then I want to switch gears. This will be a very short uh, discussion of the second topic, but uh, I, I wanted to just mention we've also been thinking about thermoplastics, which can uh, also uh, degrade in water. And in this case, we were looking at can we make a more rapidly degradable polymer? Ideally, we would like something to address the ocean plastics issue. Um, it, the, the, the holy grail here would be something that could degrade in ocean conditions, yet would form benign byproducts that would not affect marine life. So that uh, when things such as water bottles end up in the, in the ocean or bottle caps, um, they, they could be uh, just taken care of uh, through degradation. Um, but also we thought about this as another way of thinking about a chemical recycling process where perhaps we're not de necessarily degrading back to monomer, 
but hydrolysis could be used as a way to break down the material after it becomes waste, uh, recycle to new chemical intermediates, which can be reused in, in new materials. Um, and so why we were interested in acetals, well, um, acetals are, are actually quite fast uh, degrading in terms of their hydrolysis kinetics as compared to other hydrolytically degradable polymers like polyesters, which are more traditionally used. And also the type of polyacetal really has a huge impact, not only on the rate of de degradation, but also on the thermal properties. So you can see the TG for a linear polyacetal can be quite low up to something quite high for these more rigid backbone structures in a, in a cyclic or, or spiral polyacetal. And also the uh, thermal degradation temperature um, can vary quite a bit depending on the acetal uh, structure of, of the monomer. Uh, and so uh, we, what really, uh, the, the, there, there have been a lot of work by others who are making these types of polyacetals from renewable resources. So here are some examples uh, from starch, cellulose, and lignin. Um, and you can see uh, their thermal properties here. And what really caught our attention was, uh, was uh, some work um, which was demonstrated that using the spiroacetal uh, or, or the cyclic or spiroacetal structure, you can really achieve very high uh, thermal properties. For here, the TG is 160. And so these are basically bio-based bio um, super engineering plastics with, with very high TGs. And so we wanted to know, could we design a super engineering plastic, a polyacetal in this case, which had a very high TG, also th high thermal stability, and yet still retained the ability to undergo degradation at the end of its lifetime when it becomes waste. So I'm just gonna show you just a couple slides on the results here. Um, in our project, we were using, again, back to lignin, we were using vanillin and syringaldehyde to of the lignin depolymerization products I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. These are our biosourced monomers. And then we used co-monomers, which are petroleum-based, but were chosen particularly to achieve these super engineering type properties of high TG and also high thermal stability. And so uh, this is a step growth polymerization. So we basically pick one of our bioresource monomers and react it with one of the co-monomers. So you can see the four different combinations here. And what was striking is we really achieved, achieved very high glass transitions, much higher than what we had, anything we had seen in the literature for polyacetals. Um, also, in some cases, these were semi-crystalline polymers with incredibly high melting points. Um, and they also had uh, very high uh, uh, thermal uh, degradation temperatures as well. So uh, with this common, using these co-monomers with the biosourced uh, acetal monomers, we, we basically could make a uh, uh, we, we could achieve the, the thermal properties that we were looking for. And also the question is, well, can they still degrade? Can they still be um, processed when they become waste? Now these particular, this, these particular super engineering polyacetals don't break down very quickly in just uh, plain water, but if accelerated in an acidic solution, um, even at room temp, or this is a fairly mild, mildly acidic solution, we can accelerate this by going to higher pH um, we do see a breakdown of our polymer, um, and depending on whether the acetal is partially or fully hydrolyzed, um, you get different end functionality on these molecules, whether it's aldehydes or, or hydroxyl groups. Um, but we do see a full breakdown of these polymers uh, into, into small molecule byproducts. And what we're currently working on is how to is thinking about the, the nature of these byproducts, and perhaps if we're not targeting the super engineering plastics, we can make more benign uh, use a benign co-monomer, come back here, uh, that can give us degradation products that would, would uh, ideally not be harmful to an marine environment. Okay, and so uh, just in co conclusion for my talk, um, we, we demonstrated both thermoplastics and thermal uh, sets, which are derived from bioresources, namely lignin, and we were able to achieve um, you know, really competitive thermal properties and mechanical properties for the applications they would need to be used for. And in both cases, we studied the degradation of these materials through hydrolysis. Um, this can be a proxy for biodegradation, but we could also think about this as more of a chemical recycling process to break them down when they become waste into some useful chemical intermediates that could be reused in, in further applications. And in both cases, we demonstrated that, uh, that the presence of these appropriate functional groups led to the breakdown of the materials through hydrolysis. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the people that contributed to this work. 
Um, you can see a more recent picture of my group here, but the names in green are postdocs and PhD students who contributed most significantly to everything I just showed you. Um, they're the ones who did all this work. Also some of our collaborators in terms of equipment and particularly we'd we'll like to thank NSF, the Norman Hackerman Advanced Research Program and also Office of Naval Research for their support of these uh, various projects. All right, uh, thanks so much for your attention. And I think at this point we can move on to the, the Q&A portion. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Robertson, again, professor at the Cullen College of Engineering in the Williams A. Brookshire Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And that's located at the University of Houston, Texas, its own country in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her presentation today was degradable thermosets and thermoplastics from renewable resources. Again, thank you, Dr. Robertson. If all presenters now would please turn on their cameras and their microphones and return to the stage. We're gonna try and answer some of the questions that we have received in the chat today. Um, it might be a little bit clumsy because we're all remote. I think we're used to this. We've we sat in enough Zoom sessions now to know how this is gonna go. Uh, so we are gonna to get to some of the, the questions that we have right now. If we don't get to your question, then what we are going to do is forward the questions to the presenters. And if they're comfortable answering the question and if there's nothing that uh, you know uh, uh, dances on uh, something that they don't want to share in terms of intellectual property, uh, then uh, they probably will respond accordingly. But I'm sure they're going to answer all the questions that you have. So if all, the, if all three presenters are back, we'll go ahead and dive into some of the questions here. Uh, and these questions aren't in a particular order with the presenters. So uh, hopefully we can get to them. And presenters, can you also see the questions that are that are in the box? OK, I can. so if you're yeah. great now, if you're comfortable jump, jumping in, if you see a question that pertains to your to your talk or it's an answer that you think you have, uh, please feel free to jump in and answer the questions accordingly. I'm happy to start from the bottom. So uh, question 10, uh, who are the suppliers of, of these new polyamides? Uh, so the, the polyamides that, that I discussed um, in my talk are, are really still at the, at the research stage. There is a, uh, a ISU startup company called Sumatra uh, Biorenewables that is trying to, to develop um, some pilot scale manufacturing uh, for these for these monomers. And then as far as upgrading the, the monomers into finished polyamides, it's just gonna be industry standard uh, melt uh, step growth polymerization. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Uh, any other presenters have questions that they'd like to answer at this time? I saw a couple in there for you, Raj. Yeah, I'll try to answer a few of them together. Our first question was around hydrolysis of PHAs. Uh, PHAs, like other polyesters, are susceptible to hydrolysis, but the amorphous PHA, because they can be processed at very low temperatures, you can argue that they're not as sensitive to hydrolysis as some of the other temperatures, other polymers that require higher processing temperatures. Question around semi-crystalline PHA, yes. Uh, we are producing semi-crystalline PHA in our pilot plants today. Uh, they will be produced commercially in about three quarters. So this time next year, third or fourth quarter next year, when our second plant is up and running, we will have semi-crystalline PHA in the market. Can PHA be blended with starch? Yes, we're working with uh, different uh, folks who are creating blends of starches with uh, PHAs. Uh, food contact, yes, we do have food contact notification for Asia and also the U.S. We're still working on getting uh, food contact approvals in Europe. I'll stop there and uh, have Megan and Eric address some questions, and then maybe I can get back to some of the other questions that were there. Great job, Raj. Presenters would like to go next. Yes, uh, there was a question about the uh, what is uh, my thought on the extraction and purification cost of useful laden, and yes, I would agree that is that is a huge consideration in terms of uh, all of the different processes that are being uh, explored right now to break down lignin. There is an energy cost, and that has to be included in an LCA of, of any of these materials. 
So that's an open area of research as well, uh, ways to use more environmentally friendly methods, um, also uh, less expensive and lower energy methods uh, with, with uh, more benign conditions uh, to break down LinkedIn. So it's a very, very important point there. I think a lot of times with the advancements, uh, as it starts to scale, we see the price come down a little bit, the cost uh, reduce a little bit. Do you think that's a possibility, Dr. Robertson, or do you think this is just inherent? Uh, no, I think with more R&D and investment, uh, that those those costs will certainly come down, and, and everything everything gets better with more when we develop more, uh, you know, more technology, right? So that that's that's at a newer point of the process than more established, uh, for example, petroleum processing methods, for example. So, so right. yes, I, I, you know, I do think there's a lot of optimism there. Uh, you seem like an optimistic person, so that seems appropriate <laughs> for you. I like that. Uh, okay, any other questions that we have that presenters uh, would like to take on at this time so we can answer these? Uh, sure, I can uh, take a question 13 uh, by uh, okay. Mateo Gonzalez de uh, Gortari. Um, he had asked a question uh, about uh, basically the food versus fuel conundrum with with you know, applying biomass to industrial materials uh, so there's you know that's a pretty complex and nuanced question so you know you can answer it a little bit feedstock by feedstock so if you take a vegetable fat for example uh, right now the u.s alone is producing about 12 million metric tons of vegetable fat the the global dietary fat intake you take 60 grams per person as kind of a reasonable average daily intake level is, is about 80 uh, million metric tons. So there, the basic idea there is we produce way more fat than, than we need. So just, just soy, just narrow subset of food, uh, just in, in one country is, is already almost meeting the global caloric requirement just, just for fat. Uh, so, there are certain feedstocks like that where the, I think there's room for shared uh, food and industry use. Um, and then if you go to, you know, adjacent products like, uh, like crude glycerin from biodiesel. So how much, you know, how much vegetable oil do you allocate to biodiesel? I think is another, another good question, but the, the crude glycerin that comes from that is, is a co-product. So, if you're making the fuel, you're gonna you're gonna get the biopolymer feedstock as well, and then you know I think if you go to, to some of the other sugar-based uh, feedstocks for polymers, a lot of those sugars are gonna be waste sugars. So uh, digested corn stover, um, you know, municipal wastewater treatment, um, a lot of a lot of non-food sources uh, for for those types of materials. Um, you know, food processing waste, like citrus peels, for example, uh, a lot of useful precursors in feedstocks like that. Fantastic. Uh, are there more questions uh, for you, Eric, that you want to attend while you're there? Or Raj, I know we had a couple uh, there's more. There's one other about green polyurethanes. Uh, so I guess I would just point to uh, Center for Bioplastics and Biocomposites, we do have uh, ongoing uh, green replacement for, for polyurethane projects ongoing within the center. Great. Well, Eric, while we have you on, uh, let me ask, um, is there a way for the audience to follow you on social media, LinkedIn, anything like that? Um, yeah, I have a, an active LinkedIn profile. Uh, so it's uh, just uh, just my name and uh, I'm not quite so active on, on Twitter or Facebook. Good for you. You can award for that. <laughs> and then also while we're there, Raj, do you have a, a social media or a website that you want to share with uh, the audience as well? I mean, I think best for me is email. Uh, I okay. am on LinkedIn, not super active, but none of the others. Okay. And do you want to share email now or do you want to do that later? Uh, I can post the my email on the chat. Okay. That's great. Wonderful. That way, if people have uh, questions uh, that they want to continue with later, or may, they might, you know, driving home, or uh, they might think of something, they can they can do that as well. And then, uh, Dr. Robertson, are you on social or any uh, websites or anything that you would like to share with the audience as well? Sure. Um, yeah, I can be certainly contacted by email. I can also drop. I, I guess we need to drop it in the Q and A, right? We don't have a chat. But yeah. The Q and A. Correct. Yeah, so the Q and A would go to well. the audience. 
Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you, yes, you can find me on LinkedIn just, just by my name. And uh, also uh, Twitter is at UH Robertson Lab. Um, so if, uh, you're welcome to oh, follow, follow, me, follow me there as well. Great. Now, I do want to mention, too, that um, if you have questions about getting certified for today, maybe some questions about the, some of the presentations, you can also reach out, reach out to us by sending us an email. And that email address is information uh, at tainstruments.com. Again, tainstruments.com. So info at tainstruments.com. And that would work as well. Uh, are there still unanswered questions that are in the chat? I can take on a couple more questions here. Okay, um, Rush. First question was around the byproducts of biodegradation. Uh, the byproducts of biodegradation is generally carbon dioxide and uh, some residual biomass. So these biodegradation uh, processes do not go back to monomers. A uh, second question is why does amorphous PHA render PLA to be home compostable? I don't really have an explanation for that. It's just an interesting observation at this point in time. Uh, molecular weight of the amorphous PHA is about 700,000 grams per mole when it leaves our plant. Uh, then IP position, uh, we obviously have IP around the microbial engineering of uh, the microorganisms to produce these different compositions. We also have IP on uh, blends of amorphous PHA with a whole host of uh, polyesters. Barrier properties, uh, these are amorphous, the amor PHA is amorphous with a TG at subambient conditions. So the uh, barrier to water vapor and gases like oxygen are anticipated to be worse than, let's say, they are for PLA because of just the nature of the polymer. Thank you, Raj. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I saw a question on here about using uh, lignin-based fillers instead of doing what we're doing and making the, the resin out of the lignin byproducts. And I just wanted to mention that's also a very active area of research. Um, either you can make various types of materials from lignin, even nano-lignin. Um, also on the cellulose side, uh, that's also very, uh, lots of people are looking at cellulose-based fillers as well. Excellent. Well. I guess that's it then. We've answered uh, most of the questions. Is that right? I don't want to shut this thing down if we're not finished, but it looks like we may have hit the end of the internet here. <laughs> so with that, I want to say thank you for attending this webinar today, part two in our series, Advances in Biopolymers. Again, thanks to our presenters, Dr. Eric Cochran, uh, Dr. Raj Krishnayuswamy, and Dr. Megan Robertson. Again, if you want certification for today's presentation or more information about today's uh, event, please email us at info at TAinstruments.com. On behalf of TA Instruments, I thank you for coming today. Until next time, I'm your host, Gene Gates, wishing you health and happiness. Thank you for coming. <laughs>